Elections will come to order. The clerk will call the roll. Chair Click. Here. Rep Cortez. Here. Rep Boosie. Here. Rep Burroughs. Here. Rep Kane. Here. Rep Fierro. Here. Rep Israel. Here. Rep Middleton. Here. Rep Swanson. A quorum is present. <clears throat> uh, good morning, members. Uh, I would like to welcome our newest member, Art Fierro, here. Uh, this morning. Look forward to working with you. Uh, today we have uh, several folks. Uh, we have Bruce Sherbert, with, who's the Elections Administrator for Collin County, and Heather Hawthorne, who's the County Clerk for Chambers County, will address us. And they're going to brief us on kind of the evolution of equipment and methods from older technology to the next generation of voting systems and procedures. Uh, changes in elections administration in critical areas of elections preparation. Legislative changes involving voter registration, early voting, countywide polling places, and ballot by mail reform, joint elections, poll worker challenges they face. Uh, we will also hear from Ian Stuchloff, uh, General Counsel from the Texas Ethics Commission. He's going to give us an overview of campaign finance laws and online filing upgrades planned by the Commission. Additionally, he'll explain local versus statewide filings, including the complaint and inquiry process. Uh, the Chair recognizes uh, that Representative Swanson has now joined us. So first off, uh, I think we will start with the Ethics Commission with Ian Sluice-Sloth. I'm sorry. I'm Could you state your name and who you represent for the record? Yes, Madam Chair, uh, good morning. Uh, I'm Ian Stuslaw, and I am general counsel with the Texas Ethics Commission. And um, I'll give a kind of an overview of some of the recent litigation, uh, litigation that there's been on campaign finance law involving um, uh, campaign finance matters, uh, just, just pretty much on the, the state level. Um, so probably the the more relevant case is uh, Texans for Free Enterprise versus Reisman. This was a case that went before uh, the Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals, and it was basically it's basically a case that um, allows political committees that are sometimes referred to as super PACs to be active in uh, state elections. So a super PAC is basically a type of political committee that takes political contributions and it spends its funds independently from candidates and office holders. So they, they will often spend money on political advertising, but they don't contribute to candidates or, or office holders. And under state law, there has been a prohibition for many years on corporations making political contributions to candidates and office holders. There's also a restriction on political contributions from corporations to political committees, but they can give for very narrow purposes, and generally that's for the administration or establishment of a general purpose committee. They can give funds to solicit, uh, for that political committee to solicit contributions from uh, the corporation's members. And uh, the Texans for Free Enterprise involved a challenge uh, to that prohibition um, because they're, they wanted to make political contributions to uh, their general purpose committee, and that committee was not going to be contributing to any candidates or office holders. And so the, the Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals said that, that the state law cannot prohibit a corporation or even a labor organization from contributing to a general purpose committee, provided that that committee is only making its expenditures independently from candidates or office holders. So if they're not contributing to candidates or office holders or political parties or to other political committees, 
that are going to contribute to candidates or office holders, then they cannot be prohibited from engaging in that activity. So when that opinion was issued, the Ethics Commission issued a statement saying that we will not, uh, we cannot enforce that law to prohibit that sort of activity. And we also adopted um, an Ethics Commission rule, and, and you can find that rule, it's uh, 22.5, and it, it, we have that rule on our website, it's also in the Texas Register, and, and it basically it says that a, a political committee, if they file an affidavit with the Ethics Commission stating that they intend to act only as a, uh, a super PAC, essentially, and they don't contribute political contributions to candidates or office holders, then they can take corporate contributions for, um, for their political spending, so essentially independent expenditures. Uh, and as a basis of that case, we also recommended, uh, the Ethics Commission did a, a statutory change. This was uh, for the 2015, 2017, and 2019 legislative sessions. Uh, the commission had made a recommendation to basically put in statute um, some provisions that would make it clear that, these, that, that this activity is permissible. Another case is the Catholic Leadership Coalition of Texas versus Reisman. And this was a challenge to some of the uh, political committee registration requirements. Essentially, in Texas, if you're a political committee, you can only accept or spend up to $500 in campaign activity without um, filing a campaign treasurer appointment. And this challenge was to some other provisions that said you were capped at $500 in expenditures unless you had your campaign treasurer appointment on file for 60 days and you had accepted political contributions from at least 10 sources. The Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals held that those two 60-day and 10 contributor provisions were unconstitutional, but they did uphold the registration requirements. So it, it's still the law in Texas that before a political committee exceeds $500 in contributions or expenditures, they, they just need to have a campaign treasurer appointment on file with the appropriate filing authority. So that would be either the Ethics Commission, if it's a general purpose committee, or could be some other local filing authority. And as well, um, because of this decision, this was in 2014, the Ethics Commission also made a recommendation to the legislature in uh, 2015, 17, and 19 to repeal those provisions in the election code that the Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals had held as unconstitutional. There were some other cases involving campaign finance law. There's one out of the city of Austin. It's Zimmerman versus the city of Austin. Uh, it did not involve the Ethics Commission or state law, but it ultimately resulted in an opinion from the Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals that um, held that a uh, a temporal restriction on city candidates accepting political contributions was unconstitutional, as well as a requirement that uh, candidates return their unspent political contributions after an election, uh, but a $350 cap on contributions was held to be um, constitutional. The other decision was uh, King Street Patriots versus the Texas Democratic Party. This was in 2017 where the Texas Supreme Court uh, issued a, an opinion that basically upheld the status quo. There was a challenge to the state's corporate contribution prohibition to candidates and office holders as well as to political committees and the court essentially said that that, that um, prohibition stays in place um, and there were some other uh, challenges to some definitions, statutory definitions that were also upheld, uh, but pretty much it maintained the status quo. Um, now as far as the campaign finance filing system, um, as you know we, we rolled out our campaign finance and lobby and personal financial statement um, systems. Um, the campaign finance system was set out um, in 2015 and um, Currently, that there are no upgrades that, that we've applied to the application for the fiscal years 2017 and 2018 as a requirement of any statutory changes. We have requested some additional funding from the legislature to maintain uh, the Ethics Commission's filing applications, including the campaign finance system, um, and, and we're requesting funding 
to uh, make upgrades and, and enhancements and, and fixes to the system. Probably the, the most um, important development is a, um, a change to the thresholds, the disclosure thresholds that apply under campaign finance law. There has been a longstanding um, law that requires the commission to adjust upward the thresholds for disclosure to keep in line with, um, in, with national and federal inflation rates. Um, and in December of 2000, uh, 2018, the Ethics Commission published an amend, uh, published a, a rule that shows what the thresholds would be um, if they were adjusted based on inflation going back since 1992. The commission can adopt that rule at their next public meeting, and we're scheduled to meet in March, um, but we've also requested some additional funding from the legislature to support the uh, changes to the finance system, the filing system that would be necessary to make those changes. Chair recognizes Representative Burroughs. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, when we're talking about the uh, system, do you guys get the personal financial statements from boards of regents? I, yes, we do. Under, um, under state law, State officers, are, state officers are required to file personal finance, financial statements with the commission. That does include, I, I believe that, that would typically include institutions of uh, higher learning and universities, state universities, so UT, Regents, and other. Texas Tech. Uh, Texas Tech. Okay. Yeah, universities, uh, that's right. And is that the only information you get from boards of Regents, is just their personal financial statements? That is, un yes, unless you know, they would otherwise have to file a campaign finance report, but I'm not aware. Do do you publish those financial statements online through the system? No. Why not? The, there, there's not a requirement that the okay. Ethics Commission post personal financial statements to the website, unlike um, most of the lobby information as well as campaign finance reports. And um, historically, we have not posted that information to the website because there's also a requirement that, and, and this is under, under state law, there's a requirement that any time a person requests to see a campaign, a, a personal financial statement that's filed within, or if the request is sent in within two years from the date that the statement is filed, we have to collect that person's information and retain that information in our records. So it's, been, it's not feasible for us administratively to um, is that by statute or that. internal rule that you actually have to collect that information on who's requesting it? That is under statute. Okay. Thank you. And as, as far as uh, the, uh, the uh, enforcement um, of campaign finance filing requirements and the differences between local and state filing, so basically all um, candidates and holders of state offices, they have to file with the Ethics Commission and they have to file electronically. If someone is running for a local office or they're supporting a candidate for a local office as a political committee, they would file with their local filing authority. So that would often be the county clerk, election administrator, city secretary, uh, or school boards, etc. All of those reports that are filed with the Ethics Commission we maintain and, we, and we're required to post those online. Locally, it's up to the individual filing authorities um, how they maintain that information. There are some requirements that they post, local filing authorities post that information online. But there's a requirement that all of those reports be maintained for at least two years after the date that they are filed. But they, they, file gener they, they all follow generally the same requirements as far as contents of reports. State filers have a little bit more information that they have to disclose. Under the um, uh, commission's enforcement procedures, by and large, all enforcement is initiated through complaints that are filed by members of the public. And in order to file a complaint with the commission, you have to be either a resident of the state or you own real property in the state. And the um, the complaints that are filed with the commission, they do often involve state filers as well as local filers, but they all run through the same process, which is you file a complaint with the commission, 
we do an initial review to see whether it complies with the form requirements and whether we have jurisdiction. And if we, if we don't have jurisdiction, we're required to send it back to the person who filed it. If we do have jurisdiction, we accept, we inform the respondent of what the allegations are, they have you know, a certain process that they go through, they provide a response, and, and ultimately those, those complaints are resolved by the commission in one way or another. It could be through orders, assessing fines, or through dismissals, but whether they're a state filer or a local filer, they're subject to the same um, campaign finance filing system and, and uh, complaint system. So anybody at the state or local level, they can have a complaint filed with, um, with the commission alleging violations of those laws. Chair recognizes Representative Kane. Yes, sir. Who in your office reviews the sworn complaints? Uh, that is up to our attorneys, staff attorneys. So, so, okay, so only attorneys, though, review the complaints? Well, staff attorneys review them to determine whether we have jurisdiction over the complaint. And then ultimately, that decision of whether we have jurisdiction or not, the, that's um, you know, the, the executive director makes that determination. Do non-attorneys review the contents of the complaints? There are some legal staff who uh, are required to, um, to process complaints, and, and they do see the documents that are filed with the complaints. You, you mentioned that y'all review jurisdiction. Do y'all review contents? Uh, say to, like in criminal law, to see that the allegation actually fits a section of the penal code and that it's not uh, frivolous? Yes, we do. Okay, so you look at that as well as jurisdiction? Yes, and, that, and that's part of the jurisdiction, that, mm. that uh, review to make sure that the allegations are sufficiently clear and that they state a violation which, if true, would be a violation of a statute or, or a rule that's under the Commission's enforcement authority. So that, that is the basis of the jurisdiction as well. Thank you. Go ahead and quote your testimony. Well, that, that sums up uh, my, my testimony. Okay. Madam Chair. Okay. Chair recognizes Representative Israel. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, one of the media issues that's come up in the media since we last met as a legislative body was the fact that there's a chronic, um, there's a problem with those who, who, who seem to have a problem with deadlines and completing their campaign finance reports. Um, can you, do you have, would you give us a, a list of who those chronic filers are just at your next opportunity? And I would like an update on, has there been any legislation or, or, or rule passed to help with that situation so that the public knows who is filing a report and what's in that report? Yes, and, and I can get that information to you. Um, and has, uh, have you guys addressed it internally, the fact that there are um, uh, candidates or office holders who are not submitting their reports on a timely basis? We're, we're aware that that is a, um, a problem. Um, and we do post, we, we, as, as we're required by statute, we're, we're required to publicly release lists of those individuals who have failed to file campaign finance reports or other types of reports with the commission and we post them on our line and on our website online mm -hmm. there's a list it's called a delinquent filers list and there are some individuals on that list with tens of thousands of dollars in fines mm -hmm. um, and, and some of those fines have accumulated over many years um, some of those individuals um, the the fine amounts are not collectible for various reasons but um, we, but we are aware that, that that's a concern and um, we're reviewing ways in which we might be able to more effectively uh, collect those outstanding fines. Um, but how, how the process works is we refer that information to the Attorney General's office once it reaches a certain threshold uh, and then they can use other means to collect fines such as litigation, demand letters, um, and, but, but there are some circumstances where fines are not collectible, either because they can't be located or because they just don't have sufficient resources to obtain a judgment and, and collect on that judgment. So how many, how many um, uh, filers have, what's the threshold 
to go to the AG's office. For j just to refer a matter to the attorney, attorney general's office, it's a thousand dollars. A thousand dollars in fines. A thousand dollars in fines, and in order to initiate litigation, the attorney general's office has a, a threshold of two thousand five hundred. Mm -hmm. And so, um, how many how many individuals have been referred to the attorney general's office? How many do they have right now? Do you know? I I I don't know off the top of my head. Okay. I don't know. Um, but you'll get that information for us. Yes. And yes, Representative. What's the um, what What's the process, or what's the authority that you have? Walk us through the law a little bit about delinquency and and what you do, and and what authority you have. Well, the commission has authority to assess the fines, and those those fines amounts are set by statute, and. Um, the, the the process is whenever a filer has an outstanding fine, we send them several notices. We also we send them notices not only that there's a report coming up that's due and what the what the potential fine amounts are, but then we notify them by three letters, ultimately telling them that you know the, the final letter tells them that they've been referred. Um, you know, we would be, we're sending their information to the Attorney General's office for collection, and we can also um, use um, means through the Comptroller's office to put a warrant hold on any sort of payments that they may be due from the state. So that's another, another way that we can, um, we can collect on fines if they have some sort of payment that's due them um, from the state in, in, in some, some circumstances. Um, but uh, that can only go so far. Um, but once once the fine amount reaches that $2,500 threshold, then it's up to the Attorney General's office to um, use litigation or, or other means to collect. But, but our, our collection efforts are essentially limited to using warrant holds and then Attorney General's office um, litigation. There may be other circumstances that we're, that we're currently um, reviewing to see if there are, are ways to hire um, outside um, uh, uh, collectors to, um, to collect those outstanding fines, but the, those circumstances I think are, are pretty, um, pretty narrow. I think it would be limited to mm -hmm. circumstances where the fine amounts are under $1,000. Yeah. Well, if they're not going to respond to you or the attorney general's office, I'm not sure that a collection authority is going to going to help. But um, is there any legislation pending right now that you that you know of or drafted? Has any any of our anyone in the legislative body asked you for input as they're drafting legislation around this topic? Not to me. Okay. Thank no. you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, I had a quick question. So it says here that um, uh, some local filing authorities do not make the reports, uh, financial, personal financial, uh, campaign finance reports as well, on, available online. Uh, why is that? I don't know the reasons why they wouldn't put their information online. Um, that I mean I can I can speculate as to why that might be, but I haven't I haven't uh, seen any stated reasons from local filing authorities why they wouldn't post their information online. Right. Um, do you know the total number of uh, political subdivisions that are required uh, to make uh, campaign finance reports in the state of Texas? You mean that are that are required yeah, so the to total receive number them of elected or? offices? You know that. So basically, it's, it's my understanding that uh, local political elected officials are required to make their campaign finance reports available, but that they're filed somewhere on the local level and maintained somewhere on the local level. Do we know uh, how many centralized, uh, I guess it would be county offices uh, in the state or, or city? Uh, so the total number of political subdivisions <coughs> that are required to maintain uh, campaign finance reports for 
local elected officials? I don't have that number. It may be that, that we've generated that before. Um, certainly it includes every, every county, every uh, public school district, every municipality, any sort of uh, governmental entity or governmental body where there is a, um, there's an elective, there, there's a, a public office that's filled by an election. Um, all, of, all of those political subdivisions would be required to receive campaign finance reports, as well as any, any filing authority that can order an election on a measure, because you can have campaign finance reports filed with the local filing authority to show spending and, and contributions for the effort <coughs> of uh, supporting or opposing a measure that's on a ballot in an election. So I, I don't know what that number would be, um, but it, it may be that we've, we might have generated that um, kind of an, an estimate of what that number would be, and I can provide that to you if you would. Yeah, that would be very helpful for you to get a, I guess, a percentage, you know, the total number making uh, these reports available online because, honestly, I've, I've seen it go the other way where in Galveston County they used to report them online and they took them off their website. So some are going backwards. So I'd like a real-time number of where we are uh, with online reporting because, frankly, you know, the open records request, I mean, that that's the way you get these when they're not online, but that's not always the easiest or most transparent way for the taxpayers to see that information. So thank you. Okay, thank you. Chair recognizes Representative Kane. Just a, a few more questions. One is a follow-up with uh, what Mr. Middleton had asked um, regarding the uh, the local finance reports. Is that something uh, the TEC regulates as well? Is uh, the rules and laws for for local uh, ethics filings? Yes. Okay. Uh, do they file that with uh, with the state with with your organization? The reports that are filed with the local filing authority, they, they are not sent to the Ethics Commission. They're, they're maintained by the local offices. Okay. Um, if, uh, let's say, so y'all y'all cover that. Do y'all, who does the TEC um, kind of regulate? Do y'all regulate everyone in the state of Texas or, or just uh, candidates? It's any any candidate for public office, okay. as well as any holder of a public office, political committees that are supporting or opposing candidates, office holders, or measures, measures that are on the ballot mm -hmm. in an election. What um, about the whole the whole state of Texas? I mean, do y'all reach to just voters or the activities of every every person, or in order to be regulated, you have to be announced for for something? Well, and they have someone would have to be a candidate for for public office, um, but. There's also a requirement that any person, a single person who spends their own money in an election that's over $100, they're also required to file a report with the Ethics Commission to disclose that. And this, this is not making a contribution to someone, but it's making expenditures over $100 uh, independently of any candidates or office holders or political committees. So they're you know, spending money on their own. That could be for, usually that's for uh, political ads. Okay. So theoretically, we we reach into all 28 million Texans, I guess, as far as who are under the jurisdiction of the TEC? To the extent that they're making those sorts of expenditures, yes. yes. Thanks. Um, one more thing. Let's say, so someone in maybe Beaumont or, or El Paso, if uh, in order to comply, I, I guess, with the, the TEC or if something occurs, um, they'd have to come to court in Austin. Is that where where venue always is? Is here in Austin? Or, or I'm just trying to understand the kind of statewide effects of having a, a central um, administrative body of regulators. If there was a complaint filed against someone and they they live in Beaumont, mm -hmm. um, then if ever their complaint was to proceed to a hearing, then that hearing would would be before the members of the commission and. and our meetings are, by and large, and 99% of the meetings that we have are um, are in Austin. So they would so they would typically have a meeting in Austin. Okay. Um, and what, as far as uh, entities are y'all, I guess judicial or prosecutorial in nature? Then, that uh, what kind of branch of government is the the Ethics Commission? Well, the commission has enforcement powers. 
and um, so, you know, but we're but we're not we're not a judicial entity. We're an administrative regulatory entity, and so um, our so so the the authority of the ethics commission includes things like rulemaking as well as enforcement of the um, of the statutes that are under okay. the commission's authority to enforce. So you have both legislative powers and police branch powers. Well, I mean, they're they're generally um, executive in function. Although the the um, the commission was created by a constitutional amendment that is in the legislative branch. Okay. All right. Then how how do how does that square up with the holding in Buckley? I'm just concerned. Is there are we walking into an area where we might have a separation of powers issue? Well, and that, and that particular issue is currently under litigation, okay. um, and so we're, we're represented by counsel on that, on that sort of issue. I won't go any further then. Yeah. Sorry. Sure. Yes, sir. Thank you. You're welcome. Any other members with questions? One of the questions that I have is these local entities, are they essentially using like a paper filing system? Do they, is there an app available to local filers? I, I would say that by and large they are paper filers. Um, there are some um, local filing authorities that have their own electronic filing system, and there are there there are some um, private entities that or you know, vendors that specialize in an electronic filing system, and um, and you know they there's there are some that have requested that the commission approve their electronic filing system, um, but I. I think that's a relatively small number, but it's it's, it's usually your larger entities, um, cities of Austin and Dallas and others that have an electronic filing system. But what I typically see is that it's paper filing. And you know, I know that we have made some major strides with the online filing. Does the application that the Ethics Commission is currently using, I mean, is that scalable it for Possibly adding local filers at some point in time. That I don't have the expertise to to answer. Um, uh, Could you maybe investigate that and, and get back with our offices uh, on that? We we can, and and uh, our director of uh, computer services is here and available if you would like her to um, to answer your question. But I, Jesse. Jesse Haug, okay. and she has registered. Okay, that would that would be awesome. Okay. If she would come up, that would be terrific. All right. Could you state your name and who you represent? I'm Jesse Haug. I'm the director of computer services with the Texas Ethics Commission, <clears throat> and our filing system does have a local filer application that local filers are welcome to um, create an ID with their email address. Currently we have about only about 1,300 filers use it across the state for the local app. A lot of them, you know, City of Austin is a pretty big user of it, but um, I, I'm supposing that some of the other filers are not aware that we have that. But um, we have looked in the past We've had some um, bills that have come through in the past sessions that have looked at pulling in some of the local filers. Our system is flexible, it's scalable, but my hardware doesn't have the room right now. We would be forced to go to the cloud, which will take you know, funding to do that, and will take um, some time for us to figure out how to migrate it to the cloud and, and how to pull in the extra filers, but we have looked at that. So it would be a, a substantial cost, but it is scalable. It's not working. So when they use the local app, I assume that what they would do from that is possibly print off a copy or? Right, with the local application, the report cannot be filed with us, and all that data is not available for open records because it's unfiled. 
So the filer would fill out the forms. It's the same software that our state filers use. The only difference is, is that we do not keep track of treasurer information. So the filer would um, enter all the data, print it off, or save it as a PDF. They'd have to go in with the PDF writer and add their treasurer information. And of course, sign it and give that PDF to their local filing authority, you know, mail it or email it. So what about the some of the local um, committees that form regarding a, a measure or, you know, like a bond? Mm -hmm. Do they file with Austin or are they filing uh, with those entities or both? Well, a, a, um, say if there's, if, if there's there are requirements to file reports to show spending on a yeah on a bond that would typically be filed with the local filing authority. So if it's like a school district bond or a city bond, it'd be filed with the local body, not with the ethics commission. There's some very narrow circumstances they they would file with the commission, but um, but it would generally be locally. Except school bonds, um, PACs specific purpose PACs that support school bonds are required to file with the Ethics Commission. They turn their treasurer appointment in with the school board, with the, the ISD, and then um, they file the reports with the Texas Ethics Commission. But that's the only group of local PACs that are specific purpose. And you had mentioned that there, uh, if an individual spends more than $100, uh, that they would have the requirement. How many people are following that requirement? Any report that we receive, we post on our website. I don't know how many reports we have, but they're all listed. Mm -hmm. Jesse, do you have a? Um, I don't have a total number. We take in more than 30,000 campaign finance reports a year, but I don't total them over time. And those are candidates and all, but he had, in his testimony, had said anybody that spends, you know, $100 or more would be required to file with the Ethics Commission. Yes. I mean, do we have large numbers of individuals doing that? Not not large, okay. no, because no. And I, I think that probably a lot of ordinary citizens wouldn't even know that they've got that requirement. Would that be true? Um, I Probably so, yes. Yes. We, probably so. We have a, a DCE category, a direct campaign expenditure category, and we don't get that many in every year, you know around the elections those start flowing in but it's not a huge number and we th they just come in we don't prompt them those so that know just create IDs with us or request IDs with us so if you uh, sponsor a uh, event at your home and you're serving coffee and cookies and you spent a hundred dollars or more you would be re under law be required to file a report of a direct expenditure would that be correct I think it would depend on what that, what that event, um, what that event would be, what the purposes of the event would be, and what, Meet what would and be greet occurring. Meet for a candidate. Where where candidates would be invited. Yes. In in those circumstances, they if if it's a if there's a contribution to a candidate. Then that would not fall within this requirement. Um, but so I think it would depend on whether whether the money that that individual is spending whether those would be contributions to the candidates or not. And they, I'm not sure that they would be. I'd have to consider that. Um, but that, but I, I think that's I think that's possible. If a local entity. They're required to post the campaign finance reports, and they don't do so. Do you have authority over enforcing that, or not? If the authority is in Title 15 of the Election Code, then the Commission does have authority to enforce those provisions in the Election Code. Members, any other questions? Yes. Representative Israel. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Ms. Houck, uh, thank you for coming because I was, I was going to ask questions about your system. Mm -hmm. um, what, uh, since you mentioned that you're not cloud-based and, and, and I'm going into deep water real quickly when I start asking about databases, but what is uh, 
What is your method for uh, securing your data over time, since it's so much and you have um, so much history there? Well, currently, um, we have that two servers, very large servers that are in our in our office that we keep behind. They're zoned behind a firewall, and we have um, security around that. We also um, have code that watches all the IDs that log in. We also have um, footprints or fingerprint code that when there's data that more, needs more security, the software keeps track of all the IDs that touch it. And um, another thing that the state has is um, AT&T has some very good security software that watches all the data that comes in before it comes into our portal. Mm -hmm. To watch for viruses and things of that nature. Yes, bots, viruses, yeah. all kinds of stuff. Because yeah, somebody could act like they're sending you a report. And it's, right, and I've had AT&T call me. I mean, they literally call me when they see there's a compromised account coming in, and we've had it where I've had to call a filer and tell them close your bank accounts, close this, close that. Yeah. Um, so we have those kind of securities. But our, our database is, you know, it's pretty locked down. So, and, and the, the, we make a copy of that database, I mean, continually. We back it up every night to the cloud, in the secure cloud in the United States. And um, also, for our search engine that we have on our site, that is a copy of our database. And the data that is not allowed, you know, it's very secure. Like, we don't publish the... Um, contributor addresses on reports. That data is not migrated to our public <coughs> database. So we have a, a stripped down version that we run every night and post to our website so that um, we don't post it to our website. We, we actually keep that, uh, that database on another server, but it's a stripped down version that's copied every night so that people that want to run searches on our data have access to data mm -hmm. they can see. I know um, other agencies have protocols like uh, an, an external audit uh, to to evaluate your database and 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 make sure that just because you think it's safe kind of a, an outside set of expertise to say yeah it really is okay do you have a contract like that we don't have a contract with that but we do have a contract with DIR where they do um, scans on us to try to break into our system and our um, new filing system has been very tight they've not found any way to breach it mm. Okay. Thank you. Representative Swanson. Yes, thank you, Madam Chairman. I have two questions for you. Um, one of them is that um, I know that you don't list the exact addresses, just city and state, of donors to people's campaign. Um, I'm wondering if you could do something where a similar thing to people that a candidate has paid if it's an individual because many times candidates are paying young people or anybody to um, whatever stand at the polls for them or what have you and yet we're having to list their home addresses and that seems rather invasive and we, we do actually post the um, the City, state, and zip code on on our website for contributors. It's the it's the street address. That portion of of a contribution um, is required to be withheld from from but, the reports that we post online. But that's my question is right. th the people we hire and pay maybe we're having to give out their home address, and it would certainly be nice if we could do the same thing for those folks. Many of them are young people living at home. It just seems unfair to have to list their address. And under under the, the statutes that we have um, directing, they, they do direct the commission to post copies of electronically filed reports to the website with all of that information. Um, I, and I, I think it would require a statutory change to um, make that information confidential or to otherwise require the commission you know, to change the statute so that we're not required to post that information. But I, I do think there, would, there may be a challenge in that um, there would need to be a way for 
staff for the commission to identify those particular addresses that um, that would need to be pulled down from the website based on maybe being a home address or maybe being the age of the recipient or some other factors um, you know as, as long as those factors are clear as long as the criteria are clear and what would what would um, require us to pull that information down from the website then we can you know we can do that but um, that would require a statutory change as well as a change to the filing application itself and okay okay good to know my other question um, has to do with again this hundred dollar expenditure are you saying that every precinct chair or concerned individual who uh, you know gets on their computer and they make out their list of who they recommend people vote for or that kind of thing or they're for or against a bond or something and if they spend more than a hundred dollars just to make copies that they're supposed to file with you it, it is a statutory requirement that individuals or, or any single person if they're using their own funds and they're spending over a hundred dollars to make what are called direct campaign expenditures then they do have to file reports with the commission but only to disclose those particular expenditures that they make so a direct campaign expenditure if, if if they just listed a whole list of here's who I'm voting for in a primary or um, here's why I'm voting for or against this bond issue that's that would count so you're telling me that practically everybody's breaking the law around the state that that seems kind of ridiculous well I, I don't know I don't know how many people are making those sorts of expenditures um, because because social media is available and and is relatively let's say free for most people if they're sharing just sharing their information on social media stating this is who I'm voting for they wouldn't be making an expenditure to do that but if but if are there are others who are printing flyers or they're purchasing um, radio advertisements or other types of adver advertisements and they're exceeding a hundred dollars then that does trigger that reporting requirement okay Thank you. Members, any other questions? Um, oh, I lost my mind. On these uh, type of questions, these types of filings, the, the individuals, is there a financial average threshold that you see? Like maybe, because I, I, I think I agree with Representative Swanson that this isn't getting done at this, 50, that this $100 level because most people probably don't know about it. But is there a financial threshold where these reports do come in, like what, where the average is? Um, let's say it's $5,000, $500, where, these, where people start playing at a level in politics that they know they need to be doing this. And I don't know if this mic is working. Um, for the January report that was due January 15th, I believe we had maybe 10 DCE reports turned in. And I did not look at the value on those. Okay. No worries. Yeah. I appreciate it. Thank you. Any other questions, members? Thank you very much for being here today. The chair calls Bruce Sherbert and Heather Hawthorne to testify. Okay. Please state your name and who you represent. I'm Bruce Sherbet, Collin County Elections Administrator. Heather Hawthorne, Chambers County Clerk. Thank you both for being here today. You want to begin your testimony? Go ahead. Thank you, Madam Chair, members of the committee, for inviting me to uh, speak today on elections administration. I'll start with some background because I have a unique resume, if you will. Uh, I've served as an elections administrator for three different counties. 24 years for Dallas County, 1.2 million registered voters, 500 polling places. 
Ellis County, 91,000 registered voters, 43 polling places. And for three years, I've been the elections administrator for Collin County, 600,000 registered voters and about 75 vote centers. In, in my career also, I've uh, had 19 secretaries of state that I've worked under, eight county judges, numerous commissioners. Uh, I've held seven presidential elections. I've held uh, eight midterm elections, thousands of cities and school district elections. Uh, helped implement three federal acts, Help America Vote Act, National Voter Registration Act, and the MOVE Act, Military Overseas Voter Empowerment Act. Uh, so I come today with some background of small, medium, large, mm -hmm. seeing just about every kind of thing you could see in, in a, almost a four decade uh, process of elections administration. I, I can tell you one thing too, Unique, I've used every voting method except for one, and that would be stone tablet and chisel, I think, because <laughs> I've conducted elections, pure paper ballots, lever machines, punch cards for 17 years, touch screen, optical scan, precinct count, and my commissioner's court last month approved to, to purchase a new voting system, a hybrid voting system using touch screen technology for marking the ballot and generating a paper ballot for the voter to be able to verify and use that paper ballot as the official ballot of record that gets put through a ballot counter. And I can tell you one of, one of the things I wanted to mention today is every one of these voting methods from paper ballot to lever to punch card, the next generation system improved from the previous one. I know a lot of us wanna think that the paper ballot process is the purest voting form. And it is just, because it's so tangible. But the problems we have with paper ballots in the early days is voter errors, overvoting ballots, mismarking ballots, counting stations that would count, hand count those ballots would miscount those ballots too. So the next generations made the systems more accurate, protected voters from making mistakes like overvoting their ballots, mismarking their ballots. Punch cards uh, was a very reliable system, uh, except for a thing called CHAD. And we know what happened in the 2000 presidential election. In Florida, uh, the butterfly ballot that the presidential election was decided by 500 votes, 20,000 voters overvoted their ballot in West Palm Beach, Florida in the 2000 presidential election. So then comes the new generation of voting systems, the optical scan voting systems, very accurate, protecting voters from mistakes because they alert voters when you put it through a ballot counter that you've overvoted your ballot or there's a problem with the blank ballot. Touchscreen, very, very accurate, very fast, and, and it's one of the best systems ever uh, developed, except for one thing. There is, a, there is a call from the federal level, the state level, local levels for voters to have a verifiable ballot, one that they can, if they vote on a touchscreen, they can look and see uh, their, their choices on paper for voter confidence. One of the things, one of the charges for elections administrators, we have to, to start building our voter confidence again. And the way to build voter confidence is to do everything we can, end-to-end -end chain of custody, for example, of the voting equipment, audits, testing, doing everything in a very transparent way so that voters will have uh, the feeling that, yes, what I've done is, is true and correct and, and all of the safeguards are in place that need to be in place. So I'm proud to say today, I really do believe that we are entering in the best generation for voting technology. And it's not just voting equipment. It's also one of the things we don't really talk about much is electronic poll books. Electronic poll books have changed our world completely because it allowed us to, to have early voting. It allowed us to have vote centers. It allows us to not make mistakes in, in working on a, on a paper hard copy poll book where in early voting, if you go vote, it immediately marks as you have voted so you can't go somewhere else to vote. Without electronic voting, we wouldn't have been where we are today. And, and it's one of the best things that's ever happened to us. I'll tell you, if someone asked me what was the most significant change in the election process, and, and the almost 40 years I've done this, uh, early voting. Early voting changed all of our worlds. It changed your world too in terms of how you campaign. Early voting was restricted. Uh, in 1987, uh, where you had to qualify to vote. And you had to qualify because expected absence from the county or over 65 years of age or disabled. The legislature in 1987 opened it up. 
unrestricted it in Texas. And I'm sure part of the reason was try to increase turnout, but also it was just to make it more convenient for voters. Texas was one of the first five or six states to do this. Now today, we've seen what's happened. Before early voting was unrestricted in Dallas County, 5% of my voters voted under the restricted way. Two years later, 30%. In the last presidential election in Collin County, 83% of our voters voted early. 83%. In the midterm elections, 81% of our voters voted early. So it just makes sense. It was such a good and solid way to transition. It's expensive. My budget went from 1.5 million to 2.5 million in a, in a two-year period in Dallas County. So it is expensive, but it is very much embraced by voters. The only thing I want to caution you a little bit about is if you're looking at reducing the days of early voting, think of what's happening in these counties that are voting 70, 80 percent early voting. Florida tried to reduce the days in, in 2011 in their legislation. They had long lines. It was such a bad situation. Two years later in their legislature, they added all those days back and the hours back. So just be cautious, if you will, if you're looking at doing a reduction of days because it does have an impact. Vote centers. Vote centers were capable because of early voting, if you think about it. Vote centers are exactly like early voting. It's just going to election day. It's a little bit bigger process. You have more locations. Vote centers are possible because we have electronic poll books that can immediately mark you. We have DRE, direct record, or touch screens that can house thousands of ballot styles. So you're not warehousing ballots at each location where voters can go to wherever they choose to vote. I can tell you, Collin County, uh, we went vote centers in 2009. In the very first election, our provisional voters, it dropped by 30% because voters weren't going to the wrong location and having to vote a provisional ballot, voters on election day could just choose where they wanted to go vote at whichever location they went to vote. Texas was one of the first states to do vote centers. It was developed, I think, our concept uh, came about in Colorado in 2003, Texas in 2006. Lubbock was the first county to do vote centers. And then Collin County is one of the first five to, to jump on. Now you have 52 counties. Last week I read Dallas County's looking at vote centers. Dallas County had 500 polling places. They can do it now because of technology. And it is the wave of the future and it's, it's really where we need to be going. We do have a problem still a little bit with uh, uh, mail balloting. You know that because you've heard testimony if, uh, uh, if you've been reading in the papers. Uh, there's still a problem with people trying to harvest ballots. It's not across the board, it's not everywhere, but the legislature did something, this Texas legislature did something in the early 2000s that had you not done this, it would have been a way, way more significant problem. It was House Bill 54. It was uh, on the House side, Steve Willens from Dallas, on the Senate side, uh, Florence Shapiro from Plano area. Bipartisan bill, it did three things that really has kept a control of those problems that we, we, we see, see still happen, but not near as much. It put definitions in the election code of what you can and can't do if you're assisting a voter with a mail ballot at their house. Before that, there were no real clear definitions in election law. It also put tracking mechanisms, so if a person is assisting a person at their, at their house, they have to identify themselves on an application or on the return carrier envelope as having assisted. It also put penalties in place, penalties because before you passed that, that bill, the penalties were not existent in the election code for those kinds of infractions, those kinds of illegal acts. So prosecutors had to look to the penal codes for tampering with the government document or something along that line to try to make something fit. You made sure that that was taken care of. And last session, you increased those penalties. I think we're making headway. But the only way you're really going to make headway is to make examples and, and catch people trying to do, do uh, wrong in the absentee by mail. There's no area more vulnerable for elections uh, departments than mail ballot because polling place environment, you can control the polling place. You have workers, bipartisan workers. You have poll watchers. You have state inspectors. You even have federal observers sometimes. When you drop a ballot in the mail, you don't know what happens to that ballot till it comes back. You lose control of the ballot. 
So what you've done, and I just want to point it out, has really been helpful, and I know you're very concerned about continuing that. Absentee by mail. One other thing I will say, annual ap absentee by bail, mail ballot application. Started about, what, three sessions ago? Uh, it, it's a good process, but it's a process that we need to kind of corral in a little bit, and I'll tell you why. It's the process where a voter can just check a box on their application for mail ballot, and if they do that, we'll mail them a ballot for every election that year. It's called an annual mail ballot process. And it's, it's very popular with campaigns, as you know, uh, at the state level, at the local level. What's happened, though, on it, uh, voters are getting multiple applications. We had, we had uh, testimony at a conference of a voter getting eight different applications, some from the same campaign. So what's happening? Voters are signing them, signing them, and signing them, and sending them in. And all of a sudden, we're having to do all of our due diligence to let the voters know, hey, we've already got your application. On the other side of it, voters that get the applications don't really realize sometimes that that, that box is checked because the campaign's already filled out all the information except for the voter's signature. And so when a ballot comes four elections later, they're like, why am I getting this ballot? I don't know why, uh, you know, I didn't request a ballot. Well, yes, they did. So we have some responsibility to do some education on our end. Uh, but I think also if we could just do one thing, standardize the process a little bit. It, it could be as simple as starting with, if campaigns are going to do this, uh, use the same size application. I know you have attachments to it, but we get applications this size, this size. We get them all kinds of sizes, and it's hard to process. So if we could have a standard size and also somehow some, some kind of consensus to let someone look at those applications before you mail them out. We had a campaign uh, a couple years ago in a primary, mail out all these applications, and they forgot to mark the primary that the, the voter is going to vote. So we had to contact all of those voters and say, which primary were you wanting to vote for this application? So I think it's not broken at all, but I just think it could be improved on. The other thing, uniform election dates. About 20 years ago, you reduced the number of uniform election dates. It used to be four uniform election dates. And it also was, uh, before you did the reduction of uniform election dates, entities could hold elections anytime they wanted to. If it was a bond election, a charter amendment election, a special election, a wet dry election, you uniformly made it where they had to hold them on uniform election dates. My first, uh, 105 months as, as elections administrator in Dallas County, 87, and the next 105 months, I held 91 elections. And by passing that legislation, it really, it took away so much problem, not just from administration, but from voter fatigue. Uh, voters just getting just wiped out by having to vote for uh, so many elections. And I think that's a very good thing. I know there's still uh, thought and conversation about even further reducing it. Uh, I don't really take a position on that, but, but I would just say uh, we have a lot of entities holding elections on those two uniform election dates. If you try to pare them all down to one, I, I think it will be problematic, but uh, I, I don't really have a statement to make for that anyway. Okay, joint elections, I'm almost done. Joint elections uh, are a fantastic thing. Early voting has allowed for uh, joint primary elections, and I'll tell you why. In early voting, the counties are responsible for early voting. And we use the same set of clerks, we use the same qualifying tables, everything in a joint environment for primaries. On election day, if the parties don't want to be uh, in a joint situation, they have two separate qualifying tables at the polling places, voters go to whichever table they want to. But if you have 70% voting, 75% voting early, then we're talking 25% or 30% voting on election day uh, it just is an easy and perfect transition for joint primaries because of how early voting is set up. Now, that said, I've been in three different counties, and none of my counties want to do joint primaries, uh, at least right now. They may in the future. So that's a, that's a situation the parties and, and you guys need to uh, you know, work out because I'm just, uh, as an administrator, we'll do whatever you want to do on that. But I think joint elections are a tremendous thing because it saves money for entities sharing ballots, sharing locations, so entities don't have to go to three or four different locations to vote. 
So I guess in, summing, uh, in summarizing this, I just want to say I am proud of our legislature because you've done several things ahead of the curve and you haven't waited. Early voting, early out, one of the first states. Vote centers, early out, one of the, one of the very first states. Uh, National Voter Registration Act required motor voter. We were doing it already. Nas uh, the, the National or Help America Vote Act was requiring provisional voters, uh, voting processes. We were doing it already. Uh, in, in a form of challenge voting. Uh, we have been forward thinking, and so I hope if, if anything can be accomplished this session to, to once and for all allow for online voter registration. It is, it is unanimously supported from everybody I know in Elections Administration. Um, it is a good thing. It, it started in, um, I can't even remember when it started, 2003, I think, or, or some, it was Arizona's first state that did it. Now almost all the states, 40 states do it. I can guarantee you, in my mind at least, it will be more secure, more accurate, so we won't have data entry errors. And think about when we get our most cards. We get them two months before the election, major elections. We get tens of thousands of applications. We have to hire temps to come in and enter those. There's a lot of data entry errors. There are a lot of problems that could be avoided with online registration. It can be secure. It can save a lot of money and be more efficient. So I really hope that you'll consider that as it comes to this uh, committee. And then the final thing I will say is uh, funding for new vote systems. We spent $10 million in Collin County. Uh, there are many counties. And I, I felt uh, in Ellis County that the things I had in Dallas County, I had bells and whistles and all the, the, the nicest of things. I was looking for a desk and a file cabinet and a phone and, and other things in a smaller county. And, and Ellis is 10 times larger than most of the other counties. So I can tell you they need assistance on this, not just those counties, but all counties, if you could somehow find a way to help fund new voting systems. Because I guarantee you, they're at end of life if they were like ours. We, we bought our system in 2003, we're still using it. It is end of life, and I'm gonna get through one more election with it, but there are other counties out there that they don't have the opportunity to, to be where I am. So please, uh, if you will, consider that. Thank you. Representative Cortez. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you for your presentation and um, your discussion today. I uh, just had a question in regards to, you talked a little bit about the voting centers um, I think that, you know, given how popular early voting is right now with our voters, as you talked about also, and how efficient the process runs every election that I've been part of, I've seen it works well. Um, and the complaints that I hear, you know, from my voters as to why on election day they have to go to a specific um, location, whether it's a school or, 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 you know, the local church, library, and so forth. Um, why isn't why haven't we implemented voter centers sooner? Because, in you know, we have two weeks of early voting where things are going smooth, and any, you can go and vote anywhere you want um, throughout, for example, Bear County. And then on election day, that one day, all of a sudden, everybody has to go back to, you know, some small school or some some location where some people don't even know that that's their voting site, or they show up to another voting site and they told no, you need to drive down the street to go to this voting site and. Why do we change it just for that one day? Why, why haven't voting centers been implemented sooner? Well, I can tell you that voting centers require uh, touchscreen voting or DRE type voting because it's required by law. You have to have every ballot style at every location. So a number of counties are using optical scan ballots or different technology where they don't have that already in place to be able to establish vote centers. Technology, though, nowadays, are, we're able to do some things we couldn't do before. Uh, we have electronic poll books now that will allow us to have the vote center transition. Mm -hmm. uh, they're, they're much more affordable now than they were 10 or 15 years ago. That's why you're seeing larger counties starting to, to look at migrating to those for every situation. Uh, I, I think it's hard to get away. Change is difficult, and when you're talking change, Traditional polling places, it used to be the main event. And, and entities, maybe, maybe even political parties, uh, like having that, that, that model of the traditional polling place uh, so that's maybe the best of both worlds. You have the early voting opportunities, but then election day you have a designated location. The reason I think it does need to probably go full board that way is because 
so many people vote early and they vote with the, the methodology you can just pick whichever location you want to go vote right. and voters get so confused like you say on election day if all of a sudden election day rolls around they've been voting early the previous years but now it's election day and they're trying to figure out where to go vote they vote somewhere that they shouldn't if you vote a provisional ballot at a location other than your designated location it's rejected by state law there's no option it has to be rejected so i agree i think vote centers are the wave of the future uh, I think do, do technology believe, is the reason they couldn't do it probably. But do you believe, so you're saying that you believe that technology is there right now to where on election day a voter could go to any location that could pull up his, pull up his or her voter file and allow uh, them to vote any location? A hundred percent, I believe it. Now it's a, it comes with a price tag. So if you're using paper poll books and you don't have touchscreen type technology where you can house all the multiple ballot styles, then you have to upgrade your systems to accommodate that. So I think it's a fiscal issue for some why they can't do it. It's, it's not that they don't want to, it's just they don't have the money to, to implement that uh, with the required software and hardware. To where all their, their voting booths wouldn't have access to that software, is that what you're saying? Right, well if you're voting on paper, it, by law right now, the current state law, you have to have touch screen technology. Right. Uh, to do it so if you're a paper ballot county you don't have that opportunity because legally you can't do it under our current laws uh, but also if you don't have electronic poll books then you still have the same situation where you have to electronic poll books mark the voter instantly so they can't go to another location and vote that's why they're so important if you have early voting uh, you have to have a way to secure if a voter voted at location a that they can't go to location b and cast a, a ballot too but theoretically, a big county like, for example, Bear County, if, is it possible that we could allow them to, because they have the opportunity or maybe the resources to implement, you know, um, you can vote anywhere on election day. Uh -huh. Is there an opportunity we could just allow counties to opt into uh, being uh, allowed vote voters? Absolutely, absolutely. And it's been a, you know, it was a crawl, walk, run situation when the state started. It was one county, Lubbock. Then there were five counties, and now there are 52 counties. So there is a process to go through, but 100 percent, I'm yeah, saying I yes, they could. I think it's an excellent idea. I know a lot of voters that we lose who try to go to a certain voting spot on election day, and they're told no, and then they're, they're going on a wild goose chase of where they need to vote yeah. uh, on election day, and we just lose them altogether. And so yeah. I appreciate you clarifying that for me, and I look forward to additional sir. discussions on that particular topic. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thanks. Chair recognizes Representative Busey. Thank you, Madam Chair. A um, couple of questions, and you talked about the success of early voting. Uh, what is your take on if it was to be extended even further? I, I find that voters get really confused because we do early voting, then we have the three-day gap. Um, before Election Day. Can you kind of talk about the maybe the, the challenges or the strengths of extending into that time and uh, why we don't do it or, or what would be kind of the, the pluses and minuses if we did do that? Well, I can tell you just especially because of my experience in Dallas County being such a large county and in Collin County now, uh, that four-day period is critical uh, to elections because that's when the ballot boards come in they start finishing up all of their work, their due diligence of work. Uh, if, if early voting went all the way to Election Day, I can guarantee you, you won't get election results in many counties until several days, or at least two days later, because it's just too monstrous of a task to be able to get everything done on, on that one day for the larger counties. Smaller counties are a different situation. They may, they may be able to, to operate with early voting going closer to election day. I, I'm speaking personally, I'm not speaking for my organization, but I can tell you personally, uh, it would be a very, very difficult thing for, for the larger and middle sized counties to run all the way up to election day and then all of a sudden uh, you have election day and now you have to start your counting processes, you're opening your mail ballot processes, you're preparing everything for tabulation. Uh, it, would be, uh, it would be a significant challenge. And why can't that go on simultaneously? Is there just code in the law about doing that? It's re well, you mean on election day, m moving it to election day, you mean? Or well, if you, why couldn't some of that tabulation be going on, like the mail ballots and stuff like that? Is that not allowed? Well, it's not allowed right now. Okay. Uh, and so you would have to, that legislation would have to change on that end too, because right now you can't start your tabulation. You have to be over 100,000 population county to be able to start your tabulation after early voting ends. But uh, 
it would have to a legislative change to make sure that uh, you could start your counting processes even though early voting is still going on mm -hmm. and that that has its uh problems i guess just on on the surface if you're counting ballots and you're still voting i guess would be one of the concerns with that um but 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 it, i know how important timely results they're unofficial on election night but i know how important it is uh to give you timely results I'm not saying it's as, as important as accuracy, but I'm saying large county departments are going to be really struggling if, if early voting goes in and butts up against Election Day. Okay. Um, another thing, what are the challenges around Election Day? And, and I, I guess what I'm getting at is are there challenges with working with schools, finding the facilities? Because can you talk a little bit about that? We do have problems, and, it, and it's getting worse, I guess. The, the, the part of... Uh, Schools are not ideal locations if school is going on. You've got parking constraints. You've got kids going in and out. Um, and, and I know the law says if it's a public building, they have to make it available. But also as an elections administrator, we understand uh, the plight of school districts and them, them having to be concerned about their, the children and the processes within those schools. Uh, it would not be a problem at all if we could ever make that a holiday just make it a holiday and uh, then we could have all the area of the schools that we need. Uh, so I would say I've reduced in my county and in Dallas and, and Ellis um, probably by 50 percent the amount of schools we were using or maybe even more just because they weren't conducive to be able to be used uh, for whatever circumstance it might be. Uh, we could try to force our way into a school, but if we know we're going into a very bad situation, why do that? Why not try to find an alternative situation for it? Uh, locations are hard to find. People are hard to find in our world uh, to, to serve mm -hmm. in polling places. So if you're talking challenges, it, it's probably twofold. Finding people in some elections, uh, and then also just finding locations that are convenient, that aren't under construction, or, or that can accommodate those kinds of turnouts. Early voting helps with that, by the way, because early voting, if I'm voting 83% of my vote early, that means 17% is going election day. So it does help reduce those turnouts. And it absolutely reduces lines, because you don't see Texas uh, on the news feeds nationally for long lines, because we've accommodated that. But schools are a challenge. I, I, I've heard them speak, uh, and I've, I've lived it from my, my perspective. I think we all, it's a give and take. We have to give some and they need to give some, but, but we don't want to jeopardize the safety of children at the same time. So your organization will be in favor of a state holiday on election day? A hundred percent. I can, I mean, Chris is there probably. <laughs> I think pre, my president's back there, so yes, uh, he, 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 he would, I'm sure, probably. And I, I think, yes, if they could accommodate that. Just one more question. You, you mentioned the lines and how, how it's been smooth, mainly because of early voting. What challenges, if any, do you see with the end of straight ticket voting? I, I think that's a very good point you raise, and we won't know that until we actually experience it in the, in the presidential election. But when it, we were looking at buying a new system in Collin County, I had to factor in it's going to take longer for voters to, to vote their ballot. I don't know if that's exponential. I know that almost every state has eliminated it, except for maybe, what, seven states now? Mm -hmm. So it, it's it's the trend of way things are going uh, but it is a concern so to accommodate that we're going to put more equipment out we're going to have more people it's going to be more costly without it at least the first election because in, in our world you err on the side of worst case scenario I'm going to have more people maybe I didn't need as many people or as many machines as I can put out there to accommodate it uh, the ballots Midterm are way longer than the ones in presidential year because you have all the courts and other things on there. So hopefully it won't, uh, hopefully it will be less problematic than I think. I just think we just need to recognize logistically it's going to take longer and it may require uh, more resources and it may mean that voters wait in line a little bit longer. I don't think it's going to be exponentially longer, but I think it's going to be longer. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Question, please. Representative Fierro. In regards to the 52 counties that have voter centers, is there any data on what the cost is? Has the cost increased or has the cost decreased? I, I don't have any data on that, I, but I, I, I talked to my predecessor. Collin County went to vote centers in 2009. I got there in 2015. Um, and 
And I was told that because we were already set up, we had touchscreen voting, we were already set up with poll books, that it, it uh, reduced the number of locations, so we reduced by 60%. That saved money, 60% uh, of the polling places we were using before uh, vote centers. So it offset the cost. I don't know that you're going to see a significant change one way or another, but I can tell you offsetting, if you're using less location, that's, that's the lion's share of your expense of holding elections. It's personnel, sure. basically. So you do save that money, but you have to increase uh, personnel in the centers that you have because you have higher turnout at those locations. So I'm thinking what you're going to see is something not dramatic one way or another. Uh, I think it's more for convenience and, and really just making a, a, a more standard process across the board. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Any other members with a question? Representative Middleton. Thank you, Madam Chair. I had a, a quick question here. What's your opinion on November uniform election dates, especially in regards to tax ratification elections and bonds? Well, we hold elections every November. And, right. and for example, this election I'll have, uh, uh, this upcoming election I'll have probably 15 or 20 jurisdictions on with the general election ballot. Uh, last time I, I had uh, 15 locations on with us, uh, uh, entities I'm talking about, in addition to our election. We are used to holding elections with other entities. If we're already holding elections, adding a, a, another issue on the ballot really is a wash in terms of what we have to do to prepare for elections. If it's an election we're already holding, it's just one additional thing on the ballot for us. We still, we still have to go through all the other processes. Uh, if, if it's moving everything, everything to November, that, that gives me some concern because uh, I, I think probably entities will speak to it more than I would speak to it. It's putting a whole lot onto one ballot. Now, I know voters going in to vote, they're only voting their particular items they could be voting, but you're also having a, a, a monstrous election in coding and preparations that just, I, I'm not saying it can't be done. I think it can be done. I just don't know what the downside of, of losing. We, w we went from four to two, and two seemed to be working very well to take off one of those. I think. Uh, we would really want to study that to see what, what the impact of that would be. I, I don't know. That was really my question, is yeah. moving, requiring uh, moving things like tax ratification elections and bond elections to November. I, I, I have no, uh, as an administrator, I'm holding an election every November, and I know uh, constitutional amendments on odd years. Uh, we've always had constitutional amendments. I've been doing this uh, in one capacity or another since 1980. I've never had an odd year November election without one, and I guarantee I've always had even year elections, you know. So uh, it's just adding another issue on our ballot in, in that regard. From an elections administrator perspective, the bond election issue, I know that the jurisdictions say, you know, they can't wait. They have other reasons why they say that's not good. But I can tell you from an administrative part, uh, point of view, we can do that. And do you think it would allow for greater voter input? by having them on November elections only? Uh, it absolutely will with uh, uh, even your election. If you have a midterm election or a presidential election, you know, your turnout in those elections, that's the highest turnout that you have in the four-year cycle. So you're looking at 65, 70 percent voter turnout in those high, high turnout elections. If you held that in a May election, you might get a 10 or 15 percent turnout. So there's no question uh, if it's an even year. Odd years, constitutional amendments don't tend to, to vote more than, than city and school district elections unless there's some really hot button issue on the ballot. So it depends on what's on the ballot to, to give you an answer in terms of increasing turnout on odd years. It's guaranteed on even year that you're going to get a higher turnout. Thank you. Anyone else with questions? The one question I have for you, how many registered voters are in your county currently? We have uh, 600,000 registered voters. We, we uh, had 100,000 more registered voters this midterm than I did the previous midterm election. We're, uh, we're increasing our rolls by uh, 25, 30,000 a year at least. And that 600,000, does that include those that are on the suspense list? Mm -hmm. Yes, ma'am. Okay. And about how many would make up the suspense list? Uh, I think it's about, I want to say 60, 70,000, something along that line. Okay. 
Thank you. Chair. Representative Israel. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Mr. Corbett, thank you for being here. And you mentioned that you may only get one more election out of your machines. Can you give us non-professionals a reason why you're only why why are you anticipating? I, I called them jalopies, but I know that's not fair. Well, but tell us what what is it structurally that that you're only going to be able to get one more election out of those machines? The the, uh, the system we're using was bought in 2003, but it actually was probably developed uh, in 2000, 1999. And just the technology, just the the, the election coding technology, the uh, flexibility, the functionality of the system is showing its age. And it has a lot of wear and tear. Think, think of how many elections we've held on that system for all these years. So it's, it's more a concern of I'm having more and more equipment drop off where I can't use it anymore. I can't find parts for some of it anymore because they're not manufactured anymore. Uh, it's more, it's just run its course. And no system that was bought, I can tell you this, uh, no system that was bought in 2000, 2003 ever was intended to last this long. It just wasn't. The, the systems were even sold back in those days of you'll get at least 10, maybe 12 years out of your system until the next generation uh, is available. So it's just being able to, it's like a car. You know, if you can't buy parts for your car anymore, if it doesn't run as efficiently, you, you just have to look at a replacement. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions, members? Thank you. Uh, then we will begin with Heather Hawthorne. Thank you. If you'll state your name and your position. Thank you, Chairman. Heather Hawthorne, County Clerk in Chambers County. Chambers County is located between Houston and Beaumont off of Interstate 10. Um, I am here today to help you help us understand the Elections Administration. We are, Bruce and I, the face of the election uh, as far as our constituents are concerned. We follow the election code. We train and educate those involved in the process to meet the statutes the best we can. But as we all know, there will always be human error. The unintended consequences of those errors can be both costly and cause false misconceptions to Texans about the election process. We depend on the guidance of the Secretary of State's office who offers an annual three-day training each summer. Obviously, three days of training is not enough. So many clerks and EAs depend upon each other uh, as resources to make up the difference. Elections, like so many other areas of government, is not a one-size-fits-all for all 254 counties, each having major geographic differences, population makeup, and each in local entity has challenges with each election and trying to stay on task. Um, as Bruce pointed out, just um, in the uh, vote centers alone, um, I, when he was speaking of that, I was thinking about just geographically how different Texas is and vote centers working in uh, Brewster County, for example. Um, one such challenge that I think all 254 elections administrators face is the, the poll worker. We um, are demanding more and more responsibilities of these people, but they have little knowledge of the election code. Uh, recruiting and retaining poll workers is a major challenge in Texas counties today. One unpleasant experience with a voter and they're out of there. They are not wanting to have to put up with um, anything and it's usually the voter that's wrong. They don't have their ID or they're using their cell phone or something. So um, another uh, challenge is that the uh, average poll worker age, we have an aging group of people um, that it makes it difficult to find people to take their spots. I personally take better care of my poll workers so they will return than I do to myself. Um, low pay, especially during the primary on election day, is, uh, is a major issue. Um, I know the SOS has asked for additional appropriations to help with that issue. Currently, most counties are paying between eight, uh, excuse me, ten and twelve dollars. But during the primary, these election judges are paid eight dollars an hour, and so many do not want to get involved. Uh, early voting, as Bruce said, is awesome. 
we have 12 days that we offer. It gives Texans a real opportunity to cast their ballot on their own time. In Chambers County in this last November election, 75% of the ballots cast were done during early voting. Early voting is conducted by county budgets. So changes in these procedures and practices can be costly to local budgets. So we must remain fiscally responsible as we amend that process. Ballot by mail took a huge increase during the 20 election, 2018 election cycle. Um, as Bruce said, it was very challenging because there was a lot of uh, annual applications for ballot by mail that the voter just kept resending and resending and resending. So there were very uh, challenges statewide on that. Um, I think that ballot by mail has um, a, some more opportunities that can be uh, created. I feel like the trend will continue that we will have more and more people vote by mail, especially with the no straight party option any longer, and that the ballot length so people will actually stay at home and, and vote their ballot. Um, voter ID is a success in Texas. I think the majority of voters know to come to the polls with their proper ID and the statute covers the cure period if they do not. Uh, adding acceptable forms of ID is welcomed as long as the poll worker or the administrator can purely verify the validity of that ID. Uh, many voter voters no longer bring their voter registration cards to the poll. It's kind of an antiquated system now, um, and obviously it's, it's really rare, and it's obviously very rare that we stamp the old card any longer. So that's a pretty big change since 2007 when I took office. Uh, technology has greatly improved uh, the elections process. Uh, I know that in my county alone, and it's very nice, and I'm sure it's very nice for your all campaigns that I'm able to email those early voting registration lists instead of you having to come and request a copy and all of uh, the processes that were of the past. Uh, social media has definitely helped uh, the elections process in a positive manner uh, from the administrative side. We're allowed to uh, get out voter information as far as where to go, what polls don't have lines, et cetera, what, what times we're operating. Um, and the use of the Internet has, has greatly changed since I took office uh, in 2007. I'm very excited that the Secretary of State is spending HAVA money this year to require security assessments um, in the counties. So far, the feedback has been very positive. I know Chambers County, we are going to start that on-site visit this Wednesday and Thursday on the elections assessment site. Uh, we're hoping that all 254 counties have that assessment done by the end of August. They will enlighten our IT personnel and election staff as to the possible vulnerabilities and be able to assist us and commissioners' courts into what to budget in the coming months. The majority of clerks that I represent, and I'm a, I would consider a small county compared to Bruce, uh, they don't have IT departments. Uh, I, I said to my fellow clerks, I don't know what I don't know about election security and uh, the Internet. So we're re really welcoming this assessment. Um, in closing, I just want to say that as we go through this process in this session, that I feel like it would be great if you can reach out to some subject matter experts like we are um, before we just start changing the law to change the law, that we really kind of have a nonpartisan view about it because we're there, like Bruce said, every November, every May, um, no matter what. So that's all we really ask is that we are allowed to kind of give you what it's like in the trenches and how it will really turn out. Um, as far as uh, local filing authorities, I am the local filing authority. Um, I will tell you that as candidates bring in their their campaign finance reports, all we do is stamp them filed and put them in a in a paper folder. 
There's no requirement for us to put them on the internet. Um, so that's 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 how we do it. There's no. I don't have any teeth to go out. I I'm as a courtesy. I remind our local. Uh, fellow elected officials that they have deadlines I send them the forms that they need to fill out but that's about it and if I could answer any questions so in your county those campaign finance you're using a paper system then would that be correct yes ma'am okay printed uh, off the internet those forms that are on the ethics website printed off filled out handwritten most of them brought in how many registered voters do you have in your 24,000 and about how many of those would be on the suspense list I, I usually I I'm, since I don't do voter registration um, usually I it varies but I would say it percentage wise five percent are usually on on every election does that sound percentage wise yeah and do you do vote centers in your county we do not um, back to the great question because um, the statute states that as the Secretary of State you apply you go through a process with the Secretary of State it hasn't been an issue in our county because our county has geographic needs from the bay the, from from the water system that you are allowed to reduce the number of polling locations. We only have 14 to begin with. So reducing those polling locations in areas um, geographically in our county would not be smart as far as, I think it would disserve the voters of those areas if I started reducing the polling locations to create vote centers. Some of those people would have to drive 30 or 40 miles to come vote. How many precincts do you have in your county? 14. Just 14. Isn't that cute? <laughs> coming, coming from a Oh, country. well, I'm sorry. We just created 15. Thanks. Thanks, Representative Middleton. <laughs> coming from a, a, a county that has 700, uh, you know, that uh, is certainly more of a, an issue. Uh, have you, are you still using um, current, are, are you in the, are you fixing to purchase new voting systems or Thank Is that you. being discussed in your county? We purchased, Chambers County purchased new election equipment in December of 2016 um, and have a DRE system with no audit. And we paid just about a million dollars for the system. Our system was like Bruce's system that it was purchased in 2002. It even was a little more antiquated than Bruce's because we even had 12-inch monitors, not 15-inch monitors. So it was a system that I inherited as I became clerk, um, and we used it to the best that we could. And, and even more so, we had problems because of it was just a little more antiquated um, with replacement parts. Things started falling apart. So we purchased it right after the 16 election. So you've already used it for a big general election. Yes. And, you know, the, we were discussing a little bit ago with Bruce with uh, the change in straight ticket voting. Do you have concerns in your county that it will be taking longer for voters to vote uh, going into the next general election? I do. Only because, if you all will recall, when you vote on your home voting system, that it's not only just going through the ballot, but it's going back and reviewing the ballot that takes that extra step. So I do think it'll take longer. We will be having all kinds of measures, more equipment, more people. Um, our county, we have, when I ran for office chairman, Early voting was required by law from 8 to 5 in the first week at the uh, county courthouse and the second week is 7 to 7 at po in branch polling locations. So when I became county clerk, I changed that to 7 to 7, two weeks in four locations as the voter needs in our county. P many people voted 
uh, commuted to work in different areas. So I think that'll help is having that extended hours of two weeks full of voting. I think the mail ballots will increase as well coming up in the 28, uh, 2020 election. Uh, but yes, I think until we go through the process, we're not going to be able to really assess, you know, what where we failed, where we could have done better, et cetera. You, with you being a smaller county, your the length of your ballot is probably not as long as say a Harris County, which hmm. has the longest ballot. And in four the languages. Yes. So, yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, so our ballot length, and I don't think that. Uh, uh, we, we include the city of Baytown, and the city of Baytown recently on the last election had 27 amendments that they wanted changes for their, and so that added some length to that ballot. But personally, I think if people are interested, they're going in there, they may skip some things, like I think all of us have had, in the past have had a tendency to, I don't know who this uh, Court of Appeals judge is or whatever. I think that the... Uh, the ballot length doesn't matter if the voter is not in line for two hours to get to the ballot. Does that make sense? I mean, you know, if you've had to be there already in line and wait and wait, then adding things to the ballot doesn't matter. As Bruce said, we're there to, we're going to have a, an election no matter how many things are on the ballot. So you have how many sites for early voting? Four. How many for election day? 14. So you're doing a, you're not combining any precincts at all in? It will always depend on the election. Um, sometimes in a constitutional amendment election, if there's no other entity involved and it's just that, we may go and have combined where our four early voting locations become our four election day locations as well. It depends on what's on the ballot. Um, May elections also change how many precincts are open. Depending on what entities are on the ballot, depends on what precincts are open. Do you, you know, there's kind of a, uh, some counties do things better than others as far as like hearing early voting. Do you post who's voted on your website? We do not. Okay. Not required. Yeah, that for and and for again, candidates, it's a, it's a godsend to be able to to do that. Absolutely, and so like in my case, I just email. I do a mass email the next day to whoever's requested it, whether it be RPT, DPT, a candidate, right. whatever. Okay. Representative Israel, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, this this could be for. Either one of you, I know you have very different counties, and I appreciate your perspective, but since we have so many new people on this committee, um, and I'd like to hear your, your take on um, how does the motor voter uh, system work? How do you share data um, at this time? So, Representative, I don't do voter registration, so I'm going to have Bruce yeah, answer so that. <laughs> so when you say share information, can you? Well, we rely on you guys to for a number of things, of course, and that is um, you don't do anything without a good database. Right. Um, and you rely on other entities to help you with that database. And one of the uh, the only form of online or electronic voter registration that we have is via the motor voter. So I'm just asking procedural questions. How do you get the data? Um, is it good data? What What's the process like for you guys? I, I can tell you it, uh, when it first started, um, 91 or whenever it was the state uh, first start doing motor voter uh, it was a real rough edged process <laughs> it started off very the, the data wasn't as good as it needed to be uh, it wasn't timely received sometimes uh, and we, we had issues implementing it to start with but it is so much better now so much improved from what it was that it's not a perfect system but I, I can speak to this I we had before Motor Voter, I'd say 70% of our applications came by mail, others came over the counter. It completely flipped it around where almost 70% were coming through the, those processes. Uh, it, I, I'm, a, I'm a fan of it. I, I think it, it's excellent. And it's just, as I was saying, the next 
iteration would be online registration to, mm -hmm. to, to pair with that. So we get the data uh, straight uh, from, uh, from them. Uh, it's, it's more accurate than if we had people coming in and typing it in because you have, you have two issues that happen. You can't read the application if it's handwritten sometimes and you, you try to figure out what, what the name is or you'd have someone just type, type error. Uh, so uh, I, I think it's worked very efficient. Uh, it's a process that uh, I'm proud to say our state started before it was even required at the federal level. How, how often do you get the data and what's your interface with, is your interface with DPS? Or is it with the Secretary of State's office, or both? So I both. I, I mean, I I'd walk, have to walk have us my, through that a little bit. I'd have to have my voter registration person. I, 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 I'm kind of like you were talking about a minute ago. If I start giving you too much information right now, I'm going to be in the weeds giving you I the understand. information. But we have a very uh, thorough process of so receiving data from the state and then uh, processing that data. But the the verification of those voters and their eligibility to be registered is is done electronically. Well, uh, when you have a person, yes, it's not, from that location, yes. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Um, I had I had a question about list maintenance. One of the things that that you all do for the state of Texas is, is routinely manage the list. Uh, has someone passed away? Have they moved out of state? Could you tell us a little bit about what what the law is right now that gives you the direction to maintain that list of uh, as a database? Well, if we get notice uh, of a person deceased or a final felony conviction sent down to us, uh, that information goes to the state and it, and it funnels down to us. We're an offline county. We're not an online county that's on Teams. You may be on Teams, uh, which is state voter registration system. We, we send our data in packets up to the state. Uh, state sends us those kinds of transactions down to us and uh, it's a daily process. Every, so every, every day you get. It's a daily process. Yes. And who, who is that? Who is that from? Who 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 interfaces with you? Is it several people in the Secretary of State's office? Or? I, I'm not sure because I, my voter registration uh, department handles that. So I. But I you know it's daily and there's a there's a regularity to it. That's yes. It's, it's a it's a I don't want to say uh, it it's it's a very regular part of doing your job. It, it's a daily function. Okay. I think that might be all I have, Madam Chair. Any other questions? Rep uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Ms. Hawthorne, you said that you would be open to more IDs, more IDs being acceptable. Do you have any thoughts on uh, what those would be? Have you thought through what IDs you think would be adequate? Yes. I always have an opinion on All it. right. <laughs> um, college, higher level, co college so. IDs. I think that that's where we're missing the boat on some of them. So. No, I appreciate that. I, yeah. I, think, I think that makes a lot of sense since all of our college students have that, have to keep it on them for your list. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Do college IDs typically have an address? Uh, you know, that's a good question. I don't think so. I don't think so Which either. would make it hard right. to know what precinct or, or jurisdiction that would be, wouldn't it? Madam Chair, I'm sorry. Uh, uh, a follow-up to that is your, the ID is just validating that this is me. They're going to fill out a form that says this is my address and I'm, and I'm swearing that this is all correct. Is that is that? So, in other words, the ID doesn't have to have an address, I'm guessing, for you guys to, to register people. You don't have to have an ID to register to vote. So, so At the, the polling location. To, to, to vote on, on Usually that the day. first question is, is, do you still live at? But if we use an electronic poll book, that the, the address does not have to match the ID and the poll book. I that's, mean, that's it's an point. affidavit. It's, exactly. You're not, you're not validating anything on election day or early vote day, other than <laughs> this is Celia Israel and this is her, her this is her picture. That is correct. There's no need to have an address on there because you have the information in your database. Correct. Should. Right. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions? Yes. Okay. Representative Kane. 
Mrs. Hawthorne, uh, this question's for you. Um, nobody doesn't spring it on you. I'm not a good numbers guy, but your office sends out the melon balance. Is that correct? Yes, sir. Okay. Do um, you have an idea on average, uh, at least as it is in regard to a general election, uh, how early those are sent out? Like, do you, do you ever send them out two months in advance, or do you have a, a limit of how early before an election that those are sent out to, to voters, to applicants? We do. One of the challenges, uh, Representative Kane, is by the time all the deadlines are met and, you know, somebody can get off the ballot, or is that then you run up against the challenge of getting things programmed and being able to complete getting those paper ballots printed to be able to mail to, to voters. There is a 45 day before the election mandate for our overseas and military voters. Most counties are up against that deadline. I mean that they are really working to make it all those things happen probably the week before that deadline. After that, once you receive your ballots, then we strive to get them out immediately after that 30-day window. We are trying really hard to make things happen on our end, but we don't like to, um, in our office, we have limited number of resources in our smaller offices as well. We don't have a full staff to just sit and do mail ballots. So it's a little more challenging for a lot of counties that are using the same personnel. So if I've got somebody that's got to work on a marriage license, we make sure that we might not get to that until that mm -hmm. afternoon. So we, yes, to answer your question, there you go. we are trying our best to have things out by a deadline. Yeah, it's it's not a trick. I'm not trying to right, trick you. Right, I know you Let are. me rephrase the question. Um, excluding the 45-day uh, the le deadline for overseas and military, um, do you often have for, let's say, 65 years and older that are residents of Chambers County, uh, what is the average time prior to the election in November that you mail, the, mail those out to them? I would say 35. Okay. Thank you, ma'am. Any other questions, members? Representative Middleton. I just wanted to thank Heather for coming down today and working so hard for Chambers County. And also, uh, you've known me my whole life, so thank you for not telling embarrassing stories. Here. You're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> Proud to have you. Thank you both for being here today. Uh, you've provided some great testimony to give us some things to think about going forward. Uh, we have no other scheduled uh, testimony today, so uh, the Committee on Elections is adjourned.